Namaste, it's Sahara Rose, and welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast, a place where we discuss what makes you your soul's highest involvement. This episode is brought to you by Uveda. Uveda is a modernized Ayurvedic supplement company that takes certain issues that we have, such as mood, joints, immunity, digestion, and creates these custom little packets exactly for us infusing ancient Ayurvedic herbs with modern vitamins and minerals. I take the mood formula daily. It is great if you work a stressful job, had adrenal fatigue, ever suffer from anxiety or even depression, and it really heals you from a fundamental and holistic level. So if you want to try it out, head over to Uveda, Y-O-U-V-E-D-A.com. Use the code Sahara and you'll receive 35% off your first order. And they now ship to almost every country globally. So check it out. If you live internationally, they may be shipping to your country too. And they just added India, guys. If you are interested in all things femininity, menstruation, womb magic, then you are going to love this episode. I sat down in Bali this June with my dear friend Nadine of Tantric Alchemy to talk about all things feminine menstrual wisdom. She is someone who I always go to when I'm seeking more inspiration about connecting to my body, Tantra, and what the signals of my femininity, of my menstruation are really saying deeper about not just my physical, but also my spiritual health. So in this episode, we talk talk about what menstruation really means and how various imbalances like PMS or long periods or bloating what does that mean from a spiritual perspective? It is so important for us to honor our cycles. We are not like men who just are based off of the circadian rhythm cycle. Their circadian rhythm does affect us, but we are more affected by the lunar pattern, which is our menstrual pattern, which is why we're not the same at 4 p.m. every single day. We are vastly different depending on the week, the day, the month, etc. So it's so important for us to be able to deeply connect connect to our bodies to be able to tell what is going on. Are my breasts feeling tender? Is my period lighter or heavier than usual? What am I feeling in my womb space right now? And what that says about what is going on within. So without further ado, let's welcome Nadine of Tantric Alchemy to the Highest Self Podcast. Welcome Nadine to the Highest Self Podcast. It's so good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we are sitting here in Bali looking at the most beautiful view ever and already just being in Bali, I was just telling you, it like makes me want to Shakti dance and get into my femininity. So I'm so excited that we're doing this conversation live. Yeah. Yeah. It feels amazing. Yes. So the first question that I would love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I feel what makes me my higher self or brings, you know, that embodiment of the higher self is, yeah, having a daily practice that really, you know, connects me in with that energy. So my meditation, my yoga and creating that space for my creative expression to, you know, express through my body, through this vessel. So really prioritizing that as like number one, like always every day, meditation, yoga, and creating the space for my creativity to express. Mm. So, and what type of yoga do you do? Do you just do a regular yoga, more of a Shakti yoga practice? Just Hatha and Kundalini. Mm. Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah. So I'd love to know more about how did you shift from, well, your whole story, but you were more into yoga and then before that dealing with you know, your own inner journey. So I'd love to just learn more about how you got to where you are and doing the work that you're doing today. Yeah. So it kind of started when I was 14. I've shared on my website and in my story, you know, I share it a lot is, yeah, I had an awakening, a Kundalini awakening when I was 14 years old. And um, were you practicing Kundalini or? No, it was just spontaneous. It was just had a surge of energy through my body and then went into like a altered state of consciousness kind of like what you would experience, you know, on a trip or like um, if you smoke marijuana or these, you know, al mind altering substances. And I experienced that just spontaneously. So yeah, shifted my reality and I had no tools to deal with it, nothing to really, you know, base it upon. And after that experience, yeah, it was like a really confusing time. You know, there was like a lot of energy moving through my body. I was 
yeah, 14, you know, in high school. So the way I coped with it was kind of suppressing it. So channeling all that energy into my mind. So not, yeah, like allowing myself to really get into a no mind state because that's kind of what I was in for these three days. And yeah, and I was just in a really like altered state and really confused state for most of my teenage years. And then when once I found yoga and meditation in my early 20s, that's when it all kind of started to make sense, like what actually happened. And it felt like I was actually coming back into my body. So that energy came through and really took me out of my body. And yeah, it was like a you know, spiritual phenomenon kind of experience, but I wasn't prepared for it, you know, so the yoga helped ground it and really, you know, ground my nervous system, bring the energy into my body so I could actually function and feel, you know, that holistic mind, body, spirit integrated. So what did the Kundalini awakening feel like? It was just like energy rushing through my body and then just going into like a, the only way I can explain it is like feeling stoned, like no mind blank for it lasted about three days and yeah, it was, it was really frightening at the time, you know? So yeah. So in the early twenties, the yoga kind of made sense. It was like, okay, this is what was actually happening and really started to balance me out. And once I kind of delved deeper into the yoga, like the, the symptoms of that time period, you know, it was like depression and eating disorders and ang- like severe anxiety and paranoia during that 14 to 20 time frame. So once I started practicing the yoga and going a bit deeper into that, I started to really tap into the root cause of like the symptoms that were manifesting, like the eating disorder, the disconnect from my body, the depression, anxiety, and it was always around sexuality. So that took me on a journey into really going into a lot of the core root of my trauma, which was sexual abuse as a young child. Yeah. And then I started working with, with women with eating disorders, you know, that's how So I started with the yoga and nutrition and that went into, you know, helping women with eating disorders because that's what I was going through. But then it always came back to sexuality for myself and obviously my clients because it was like whatever I was working through my clients, I was helping them with after I'd kind of, you know, clicked something in my puzzle. So, yeah, so from that it kind of like shifted into the root cause of my my journey was like reconnecting to my sexual innocence and reclaiming that sexual power and that erotic innocence and yeah that's been the root cause of basically everything awakening like you know my creativity my life's purpose like feeling in my body like embodied you know bringing that spiritual energy into my body like we're talking about the higher self like into the actual physical experience it's been the sexual connection like that's and the work with the womb so that's what I work with now directly is is reconnecting women to their womb space their menstruation their bodies their sacred sexuality yeah I love that and you totally made your mess your message yeah so so a lot of people have had sexual traumas and it's outstanding how many as young children. So what often happens is you either one, totally repress your sexuality or two, act out in sexual ways to gain like attention from similar people to the perpetrator. So how did you harness your sexual energy and embody it while still not falling through that very delicate, you know, path that could lead to, you know, using it for power and feeling like you're worthy? Yeah, I mean, that's been a massive journey because it's like, it's, yeah, as you say, it's usually you go one spectrum or the other, like the extreme over sexualization or then the like just cutting off. Like, so I've gone through those polarities like throughout my whole life. And, you know, it's only been recently, really, in the past few years that I've, from a really deep relationship the past couple of years or ended a year ago, but that relationship two year container like really healed a lot. It was through that deep tantric relationship being you know entered with pure love and just that safe container of yeah a relationship between two people and it really was the missing link of really feeling my sexuality connected to my heart you know like consciously going into that and feeling that connection so now it's like when I express my sexuality it's not in a way of trying to get 
attention. It's just like a, it's a way of expressing like all this like divinity, all this like life force energy through my body to share, you know, like a giving energy, not as opposed to like trying to take from people. Mm. So I feel that's been the missing link. It's been like connecting the heart space with the womb sexual center. And that's, you know, that balanced mm, and erotic that's, innocence. That's so well put because I feel like a lot of times we feel like by expressing our sexuality, it becomes this like you're trying to get attention from people or you're mm. trying to show that like you're worthy of being loved, but seeing it as like an offering of like, this is just my inherent nature yeah. for both men and women just changes the game because it doesn't matter if no one's in the room or not, you're still your radiant sexual life force filled self. Yeah. And that's it. And that's what I feel the difference is. It's like radiating out, you know, so that energy is like, shining out as opposed to like kind of a black hole like yeah. pulling it in mm. so that's been yeah the missing link so true I remember when I was like a freshman in college I would like get dressed up and like try to like look super sexy but it was such a you know yeah. I thought I was radiating out but the re I was only reading out to pull in and yeah. I think a lot of us especially in our like early like late teens early 20s that's all we know because it's all we see on tv yeah yeah and that's external validation and you know it's hard like I often especially with this social media world we live in it's like such a hook or like a trap that we can get sucked into like ex being externally validated mm -hmm. from likes and whatever like shares and everything on our social media so it's like having to constantly check in like okay like <laughs> where am I coming from what is my intention for putting this out there and really like keeping that as a leader you know in this for feminine work it's like yeah keeping that intention every time something does go out like yeah that it's like empowering others mm-hmm yeah, totally. So I want to talk about the womb and how we hold on to traumas in our womb space. Can you speak a little bit about that? Because it's something that yeah. a lot of people have still not heard of. Yeah. So basically the womb is the seat of like our subconscious mind. So basically like with, yeah, any suppressed trauma, any, you know, lodged emotions, any stuck energy in our body of our own and also our sexual partners. So we take that on into our bodies as women. We get stored in our womb space and also in, in Kundalini Yoga, they teach like the, the arc line of the nipples. So mm -hmm. nipple to nipple, we store our men, any sexual partner, their DNA and their karma comes into our nipples and our womb space. So, and also our own. So it's important that as women that we're clearing our womb consciously through our menstrual cycle each month, having a conscious practice and awareness around our menstrual cycle, like what is it we're actually releasing each month that we bleed? What are the signs that are coming up in the form of, you know, physical pains, emotional disturbances? Because all these things are the subconscious emerging during that time, during the just before we bleed and then when we bleed, that's when the veil is so thin and the subconscious is literally coming into the light and wanting to be seen and felt and heard. So yeah, by just bringing awareness into our menstrual cycle, even just understanding that, then we can actually use that time as a powerful time to clear what wants to come up from the subconscious. So things that are, you know, stored in the subconscious are traumas, you know, limiting belief systems, like anything that's not our higher self, basically. So we can bring that to the light and shine light upon it and love it. So what does it mean when some women have a lot of pain during our menstrual cycles? I know some of my friends, when they get their periods, they're in bed, especially that first day, and they feel immobile. So what is this our body is signaling? Yeah, so it's basically your body's really sending strong signals and messages to you to stop and slow down and, and listen to what is, you know, coming through in the form of the physical pain because you know beyond the physical pain it's linked into the emotional pain and then beyond that it's it's the spiritual root cause you know the layers of of disease starts in the spiritual body then the emotional and then the physical so it's coming to your physical body to symbolize hey there's something here so there's an emotion deeply stored in your womb in your subconscious that wants to be looked at and addressed and the more that we ignore it or you know take a panadol or you know, just get on with your day, then it's going to get 
stronger and stronger and stronger. And so that's why women experience really strong, these like pains and symptoms is because I believe it's like, they're not like going to the root cause and creating that space themselves each time they bleed and before they bleed, when these pains arise to really sit with what's there. Because once you really feel it, like I said, it just brings it to the light and then it can just dissipate and, you know, be seen, felt and heard and release from that. Mm. Cause it's like anything, the more you push it down, push it down, push it down, it's just going to get more and, and take over you. So what would you recommend for someone to kind of figure out what the root cause of this pain is? Yeah. So it's like, I teach this a lot in my work is emotional alchemy. So it's like creating that space and with tools such as like breath, sound and movement and awareness going into, so when you feel the pain, like the period pain, stopping everything and really feeling it and going into it with breathing through it, sounding through it and moving through it and having that awareness of what you're doing during that process. But, you know, three key tools just to really, yeah, create that space to actually feel what's actually there and, and alchemize it. So the emotional alchemy is like going into the emotion and alchemizing it, like breaking it up and so it can be freed up. Mm. So really just feel into that pain and how important is it to know like what is the actual cause like to go back and remember when I was seven years old this happened or whatever else? Yeah so I mean that that is like a process that you know I, I teach as well is like that inner child work so you know it's usually something from the subconscious and then going back into like the so the last time you felt it and then the first time you ever felt it and it's usually something to do with childhood you know like and when you can kind of like understand that, it can it can make sense of it. But in a way, I don't know if it's really that important knowing like having to go into an analysis of every single thing when you felt it as a child because it can get a bit of a, you know, a mind. Right. Like you're just in a process forever. So it's kind of like I like to just guide people into like drop the story, just feel it, what's present and just move it with breathing, awareness, sounding and movement. Yeah. Mm. Totally. And I think that sometimes it can go both ways that there's either something that happened in our childhood that we are in denial of, because when we think about it, it just brings up too much fear. Yeah. But also what can happen is when you're like, something must have happened, something must have happened, your mind can begin to create stories. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just reading this case that happened of this woman who was doing, she was like very feminist and doing a lot of female empowerment work. And then she had the kind of a dream that her father had like molested her when she was a child. So she came out and it caused her parents to separate and it created like this huge riff. And it was a lot about what she spoke about. And then in deep psychotherapy, she realized she had created that story. Oh, okay. And then she approached her dad, but her dad was like, I'm never going to forgive you for this and, and separated the family. So it's like, oh my God, how do you know when it's yeah. like real and you're being bold or it's something that your subconscious made up because it wanted a reason to be angry? Yeah, yeah. And then if it's like, you know, holding on to these stories, then it's like they can bind you because like, oh, this is why I don't I don't have a partner because of my childhood. Totally. Or, and then you just keep holding on to the story. Exactly. So it's like, okay, yeah, things happened. We need to acknowledge it and, but not like let the story rule us. Like totally. Cause it brings us forward. back into that victimhood and so many people, mm. oh wow, a butterfly just flew in the room and flew right in between <laughs> us. Wow. But I so see so many people mm. like, oh, I can't get into relationship because this yeah. happened to me as a kid. And they use that as, as an excuse to not grow and move past it. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel it's like the inner child work is really important. Like going into like when you felt it and creating, like giving yourself what you needed back then, that's more the empowering. Like, okay. Right. So I felt abandoned as a child from my dad or my mom or whatever, you know, it's like a root thing for so many of us, like abandonment. It's like, okay, how can we like now as an adult, like hold ourselves and give what we needed back then as a small child that's still within us now as an empowered woman or man, you know, and not mm -hmm. let this inner child run the show. Yes, they're there, like, but it's not like that's the 
driving force of the vehicle anymore. Totally. Because, yeah, because that trauma, the abandonment could be like you're at the bus stop and your mom didn't pick you up for an hour. And that could be the issue. Or it could be like your family literally left you. Yeah. But it's still this, you're still feeling that same thing. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So if people have painful periods, it's often that. Now, what about people who don't feel any difference when they're on their period or not? They're not feeling these kind of like waves and energy. What would you recommend for them? Yeah, so it's all about, you know, as you, you know, you practice the yogas and the tantric arts, like the more like refining of your energy you get, the more yeah, you start to feel the subtle energies in existence. So you can just feel like, yeah, it's fine. But then once you start to kind of sensitize a bit more and like start to tune into, yeah, slowing down and feeling the subtle energies, you do actually feel these rhythms. And I would suggest to, for women, you know, to track their periods. So when they, yeah, like the 28 day cycle or 30 day cycle, whatever, you know, your, your cycle is like every day, just writing down, journaling like how you feel that day and really you know taking the time being honest with how you feel and noticing how your moods change how your physical body feels different because it does you know it's we're not like flat line like the feminine is the cycles you know she's like nature so the masculine is more of that sun energy straight like they still have moods and fluctuations but our hormones literally like biologically ours go in a full like peak and trough like really spike up and down whereas the men's hormones are more flat line right and 24 hours circadian yeah for the men and we are more like the lunar cycle yeah exactly so when we're ovulating you know that's when we're at our peak like that's when we're in the yang phase the most like our hormones are at their peak so we're more outward at that point and then when we're bleeding that's when our hormones are at their lowest levels so that's when we're more in the yin phase and more inward and you know, as you start to like, yeah, take note of this, you start to kind of realize, oh yeah, like I do feel more, you know, I just want to be alone when I'm bleeding or when I'm ovulating, I'm like just out there and I'm on a mission and I'm doing my thing in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us like how we can arrange our schedules to be in tune with our menstrual cycles? Yeah. So like I teach with the menstruation magic work. So yeah, understanding the four phases of the cycle. So there's four weeks, you know, obviously in the menstrual cycle, if you're on a 28 day approximate. So the four phases, understanding what they are. And can you tell us what they are? Yeah. So the first week is day one to seven. So that's when you're bleeding. So this would be like the winter phase or the, yeah, that like inward priestess energy phase, or if you're looking at goddesses like Saraswati, you know, in Ayurveda is actually, you know, the vata. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you talk so about So they it. would consider vata when you're bleeding? Yeah, like that's, yeah. Because I would think it's like when you're like out doing all of these things. When you're bleeding? No, when you're, vata would be like more of a ovulation or, or a luteal oh. phase. That's how I would imagine my in my mind. I would feel yeah. like when I'm bleeding, I'm kapha. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like one perspective. It's more like, yeah, like what I feel. Like I feel mm-hmm. very like, because the veil is so thin when I'm bleeding. You feel your most creative. Yeah, yeah. And really like, because you are very sensitive energetically and your aura is very, very large when you're bleeding. You know, it's why women aren't allowed in like, you know, group ceremonies mm-hmm. and in many temples because of that reason. It's like, because their f- energy field is so strong, it's like affecting the group prayers and the group mm-hmm. ceremony space. So they need to be connecting in with their channel and collecting information, you know, for how they can serve the community and their families and their work. So that first week when you're bleeding, because of that, that energy is very, yeah, like that yin phase, like really internal, taking that time, especially the first two days to really just be with yourself and listen and create that space. Yeah. Listening what's happening in your body, listen to the messages and the inspiration that's coming through because you're so sensitive at that time, like energetically, as I said, the veil is thin, you know, between your spirit and physical and yeah. And so then after that week, you know, day seven to 14, this is when we move into the second phase. So the second week that would be, you know, when the hormones start to pick up and it's the like the spring phase so you know it's like you've after the winter you've gone into the hibernation then you start to come out and 
these like fresh ideas have started to bloom from whatever inspiration you got from that first week. Yeah. So really like taking advantage of that week to, and because like your hormones are rising up the left and right hemispheres of the brain are balancing and quite balanced. So it's a good time to be doing a lot of like analytical thinking stuff. So research and, you know, so if you got any ideas in the first week, that would be the week, the second week to research them and like, yeah, not fully actioning yet, but just like researching things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then so after that week, we move into the third week, which is like day 14 to 21. So, you know, around day 12 to 15, 16, that's when you're ovulating if you're on a 28-day cycle. And so that's when your hormones are at their peak and that's when, you know, your energy is at its peak. And, yeah, it's that summer phase this week. It's like you're out in the world. Like this is when you've got the most energy, you're out doing your thing, the most yang energy, really taking advantage of that week. Yeah, like, you know, any speaking engagements, any like workshops or retreats I'm running, I always kind of plan it to be that week Mm because that's when I'm like on point and really like you know communication is the most would that be like the Durga week yeah the Durga like warrior woman yeah 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 like from day seven to 21 it's it's meant to be like kapha like that yeah it's interesting a grounded energy Hmm. yeah and then like the last week of the cycles so day 21 to like just before you bleed. Right. So 28, 21 to 28, that's the the season of um, autumn. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, as you your womb is starting to shed, if you don't get pregnant, obviously, the womb lining is, is starting to shed and obviously what is like wanting to be released and shed emotionally and energetically is also starting to fall away. And so, you know, autumn, like it's when the leaves are falling and dying to be reborn. And so with this phase, it's like, it's said to be like the pitta phase is the, the fire, like the transformation is like meant to be happening now. So would that be Kali? Yeah, Kali phase. Mm. So <laughs> so it's like bringing in that energy of transformation. Like Kali is all about like shedding, slaying, like mm. the ego slaying, releasing what's not serving you anymore. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they call it like this syndrome, but it's like PMS, but it's actually not a syndrome. It's like the most powerful time of our month as mm-hmm. women that we really get to actually embody this shamanic death and rebirth mm-hmm. like we're dying like to an old part of ourself our womb is like releasing so the next month we can rebirth literally ourselves into you know more of our higher self and more in alignment with what we're here to actually do and from like the soul space and mm-hmm. So this week is really, really powerful and this is what I teach like with a lot of the emotional alchemy and the inner child work, these processes of like holding space for yourself, navigating this, the shadow, the things that are coming up from that week. Because if you notice, if you start to track it and take note, you notice that like it's usually similar themes that come each premenstrual phase. Mm. It's like because it's, yeah, until you really look at it, it's just going to keep popping up Mm -hmm. you know and then once you fully face it go into it then it's yeah dissolves so true yeah like I've noticed that just like oh okay this is the same thing so I'm like not really like going into this the root of it you know Mm -hmm. and then once you do it's like once I did it's like yeah it's gone so it Mm -hmm. doesn't have that hold over me anymore it's like for sure yeah I think that for a lot of us like maybe we don't realize but the same things are coming up at certain times like I like this week is I'm in my fall phase of letting go and I'm like oh my god I'm like I'm just realizing all of these things that I've been kind of doing but like dealing with that actually like are not serving me or annoying me just like you know being on social media the influx of messages and the influx of emails and comments and like like I deal with it but I've been realizing it's just so not serving me and like so recently I've been I like announced I'm like I'm not responding to all of these personal questions and DMs and stuff like I have my frequently asked questions here like refer to that so I'm and this comes up for me a lot but this time it's like very in my face so I'm wondering if it's like every like yeah. luteal phase that it's like okay shed 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 so yeah. I'm gonna keep I have the daisy which is the thermometer okay. to tr- track your ovulation which is an amazing tool. Have you heard of it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it basically will tell you, once you start using it regularly, it tracks like 
to the like second decimal of what your temperature is. So it will tell you exactly like what are your like red light and green light days and green lights are days that you could have unprotected sex and you're not going to get pregnant because you're not ovulating or near that window. And then your red light are the days that you might be. So it's like a really simple tool because I used to try to write down my temperature every day and track it, but I would never keep up with it. But with this, you just take your temperature and it tells you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. And that's the thing. Like once you get also more aware of your own body and your cycles, it's like, you don't need to be on the pill and these artificial because it's like, you can actually, I can actually feel when I'm ovulating now Mm -hmm. and you know, the women I work with, it's like your discharge changes. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like, like every woman should track their cycle. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I suggest getting these apps. There's so many apps you can get. Like, so track, you know, when you're bleeding and then it sends you a notification, you're ovulating now, you know, so it's like so easy now with all this technology and, and just knowing your own body as well. It's like, oh, yep, I can feel like I'm a bit bloated now or like discharged. So it's like I'm ovulating. Mm -hmm. It's all about bringing more body awareness, more Mm self-awareness. Have you heard of adaptogens? I mean, if you're listening to the Highest Self podcast, probably, but have you actually tried them and used them as part of your daily life? Well, if not, I have the exact solution for you. It is called We Are Rasa, a coffee alternative made with seven adaptogens and two mushrooms. This adaptogenic blend is absolutely delicious. I've been having it with my breakfast, with lunch, in between meals, with dinner, and it essentially gives your body what you need, providing you with stable calm energy without any caffeine in the morning but also helping you sleep at night and this is the beauty of adaptogens which i talk about with the founder of rasa lopa on episode 133 adaptogens 101 you gotta listen to that episode but adaptogens give your body exactly what you need so they are very intelligent herbs and work differently on your body at different times of the day so whether you're looking for hormonal balance anti-stress adrenal fatigue whatever it is adaptogens will provide it with you Gotta love these herbs. So head over to wearerasa.com forward slash eat feel fresh for 20% off your blend of rasa. Again, head over to wearerasa, R A S A dot com slash eat feel fresh for 20% off your rasa coffee. So, what do you notice in your body when you are ovulating? Yeah, it's like just lots and lots of energy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've got like so much energy and yeah, like the discharge, like it's it's thicker and I also feel like in my ovaries, like which one it's coming out of. Mm, Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I'll get like, so this month there was, it was in my left, there was a lot of activity and then I got like some pimples on the left chin, you know, that area Uh of the ovaries. So there was a lot of stuff happening in the left ovary this Mm. month normally it's the right so something different was happening that's so fascinating you could tell which side yeah yeah I'm I'm sure if we all tune in we can do that yeah yeah so I'd love to know more about what about women who don't get their periods regularly they have longer cycles or it's just it's not the same how can they do this yeah so I mean if you don't have a cycle if you're you know menopause or just if it's gone missing if you've just come off the pill, that's usually a time when it leaves. Like mine didn't come for a year and a half after I got off the pill because it has to adjust. I just suggest to work with the moon cycles. So when it's the full moon, just like act as if that's your ovulation time because it's kind of like when most women were either ovulating on the full or new moon. Mm-hmm. So the full moon was, you know, is when the 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 light in the sky is the most bright and there's a lot of energy. So if you pretend or you know, that you're ovulating then. Mm -hmm. And then when it's the new moon, that's when you're bleeding phase. So kind of going into your own little retreat space just for a couple of days, like around the new moon. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not bleeding, just like, yeah, taking that time that you would do if you were bleeding, like reflection, Mm -hmm. self-reflection, like journaling, you know, take yourself on a mini retreat for like one or two days. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, I find that's really beautiful. And that, I did that for that year and a half that I wasn't bleeding and then all for the last kind of five months of that year and a half Mm -hmm. and it synchronized straight up with the moon after I started doing that, like Mm. just practicing with the moon, then it came like on the sixth month. So So what about if your period is not synced with the moon? Does that mean there's an imbalance going on? No, like I don't like to, um, because then women can get really like 
oh, is there something wrong with me because I'm not in the moon? And it's not about that. It's just like, yeah, you know, in in the olden days, mm-hmm. like in, they talk about that. It's like in when all women were living in nature, in villages, we would all be synchronised with nature. So we would naturally, you know, adjust with the moon cycles. And I, I feel, you know, that is the way we should be living, like in accordance to nature, obviously, it's like the Ayurveda teachings, it's like the Tao, like everything has just come back to the way of nature. And so until then, I mean, there's nothing wrong with women if they're not. It's just like, yeah, don't hold that like guilt or shame around because that's going to like create the opposite effect in your body. Totally. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've definitely been like, oh, why aren't I in sync? And I have like, I've spoken about this on my podcast. When I got off the plane, I didn't have my period for two years. And it was also because of, I was very Vata, Vata imbalance yeah. in a relationship that wasn't serving me. My body didn't want to reproduce. And like practicing a lot of Ashtanga yoga, which is a very masculine practice. Yeah. So yeah, my femininity essentially just like shut down. Yeah. And it's also, you know, it can be in times of really strong spiritual energies because yeah. your blood is like your life force energy so if you lose if you need that energy for mm. like other pursuits like you need it for spiritual surges through your body or like creative energy if you're a phase in your life where you're needing to use that energy for other things then it can stop in a way and so it's I've kind of been looking at it from that perspective like yeah maybe it's just these times because when I look back on that time when I came off the pill as well it was like a time of huge awakening and changing like my path like radically so it's like my body needed that energy to do what I needed to do and then it came back so yeah just for women who don't have a period if they come off the pill like just know that there's nothing wrong with you like it will come back Mm -hmm. it adjusts when it's ready and just like maybe it just you need that energy at this point of your life to just keep it for yeah your creative energy your spiritual energy Mm. yeah that's a really good perspective I haven't heard of that before I remember when I wasn't getting my period I would go on these like raw vegan forums and they were like if you don't have your period that means you're at like the heightened state of purity and like women in tribes in Africa don't get their period because it's so they're so pure so I was like oh really so do you think that that's the case or do you think that that is maybe because of the actual malnourishment that is going on there well yeah I mean there could be two things like yeah if you're underweight obviously you know it stops because yeah you don't have enough energy to reproduce a child so you're holding on to that life force Mm -hmm. energy for yourself but also yeah I believe I mean for myself and with women I work with like over time doing these like clearing practices looking at like the things that are coming up from the subconscious over time, like the blood gets like less lighter and yeah. lighter. Like, so I bleed for one day now wow. and it's, there's no problems with my iron or any, you know, anything with blood levels or vitamins. It's purely that, like, I know it's that it's because I've done so much conscious work with like clearing the stuff that, mm. yeah, I don't need to lose all that life force anymore. Like I'm also um, doing the tantric practices, like recirculating my life force energy every month. Mm-hmm. So Every day you're using 40% of your energy to produce eggs. Every day is like 40% of your life force energy is being used to that. So if we're not circulating that through our body with like practices like, you know, tantric practices, breathing, yoga, then your periods are going to be heavier because all the energy is just getting stuck there and it's not being redistributed through your body. Mm. So these practices help, yeah, like diminish like the period but like, it's more like about yeah retaining your life force energy because mm. you don't want to be leaking out. It's like a, a man, same as their semen. If they're ejaculating like five times a day, they're going to have no energy. And if we're bleeding so much, then that's why, you know, you're losing all that life force energy. So we need to be circulating it through our body. Mm. So do you think women who, because I know some women have like eight day heavy periods. Is yeah. it like their body just has a lot that they're trying to release? Yeah, that and yeah, and, and probably just not yeah, having a practice around circulating that energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. One of the practices that I learned, it's a Taoist practice from my Yoni Yoga teacher. Yeah. Um, it was called the Upward Draw. Yeah. And so you kind of like, it's not like a Kegel, like it starts like one, but then you work upwards, like the inner vaginal walls and like all the way up and you synchronize it with the breath to literally kind of like squeeze 
scoop the energy up the body. Yeah. And another one was this breath that kind of moves like circular from your back to your front. Yeah. So can you explain some tantric practices or Taoist practices that yeah. people can do at home? Yeah, like that's two of them. Like basically the main one I share is that is the circulating one. It's the ovarian breathing. Mm-hmm. So you're drawing the energy from your ovaries into the base of your spine and then breathing it up the back of your spine into your tongue, like the roof of your Mm -hmm. mouth, like this is where like that circuit seals and then drawing it back down the front of your body. So, you know, that simple ovary breathing. So it's like building the energy in your ovaries and then like taking it into the base of the spine and breathing it up your spine and back down. So you start you so you start with your ovaries, then you bring it down to the base of your spine and then you would bring it up your spine then over through over your head third eye and do you put the tongue on the top of the mouth yeah so guys you put your tongue on the your top of your mouth like you're like (laughs) yeah and then breathe down so do you do this all in one breath or how do you do it I usually just so place my hands over my womb like in the downward triangle and breathe so breathe in and just start to build the energy in your womb. So bring awareness. And that's where your pinkies are is that over your ovaries. So it's kind of like breathing the energy into the ovaries, kind of, yeah, your awareness and energy, like building the energy and then imagining or visualizing that once you've kind of built that energy through the ovaries, drawing it down into your tailbone, into the base of the spine. And then inhale up the back of the spine, tongue onto the roof of the mouth. And then exhale out your nose and draw it down the front of your body back into the tailbone. So it's like you're building it, building it through the ovaries, draw it out and then circulate it through. Mm. So that's like really... Do you call it the cosmic orbit? I think that's what she would she was calling it. Yeah. So if you guys Google cosmic orbit breath, you'll probably find tutorials. I always found it really hard because I'm such a chakra person that whenever I breathe up, I just want to breathe up through the front of my body through the chakras because I'm just so used to it. So the moving down and backwards and up over my head was like I was losing sight of the energy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And there's also, you know, the practices like, I mean, the kundalini yoga practices are all about drawing the energy up, you Mm -hmm. know, circulating. So kundalini yoga is amazing. Yoga in general. I mean, that's just like what yoga is all about is just awakening the chakras, moving the energy through the body. And then another is the jade egg practice. That's, you know, I teach that as well. Yeah, for women as another supporting Mm -hmm. to really, you know, help clear stuff, anything that's in the in the womb, in the yoni, and also, um, yeah, bring that awareness to that mula bandha, mm-hmm. you know, the pulse of the PC muscles, which, you know, if we have like weak PC muscles, mm-hmm. then that vital energy, our life force energy is going to be leaking out. So the jade egg helps tone those muscles, mm-hmm. not tighten them, but tone them. Like, you know, you tone your muscles, like lean muscles. So then that energy is contained and it's not getting leaked out mm-hmm. every day. So jade egg is really powerful for that and even just mula bandha practice Mm -hmm. like doing when you're sitting in the car so mula bandha for anyone who's listening is just that yeah like squeezing for women like you'd be squeezing like a pee like you're Mm -hmm. on the toilet like weeing and you're just squeezing stop and then release stop and release so it's like sucking up the sex organs that is really powerful you know just to tone that whole area and bring awareness to that area even Mm -hmm. you know and I've also heard that you shouldn't be doing these exercises while you're bleeding yeah. because you don't want to be moving up that time. And they even say, don't even practice yoga, like especially yeah. the first day or two. Don't do anything that you're upside down. Yeah. Like really let the energy move downwards. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, especially first two days, just shavasana or like just hip openers. I feel really right. good just to like, you know, circulate. Like I tend to just do more like dance on those two days like mm-hmm. circular movements through the hips yes, and just yes. get the blood flowing shaking that mm-hmm. helps also mm-hmm. just move any th- and stagnant. I feel like that's like the next phase of what yoga is going to look like because a lot of the yoga that we practice is so masculine and structured and there's like no hip movement yeah. and you see a lot of these like super hardcore yogi women turn almost like super masculine yeah. and because you know yoga 
originated as a practice for like young prepubescent boys to like keep their hormones down so they can really sit in true asana and sit in stillness. So I feel like the next phase of yoga is going to be bringing in that Shakti and that like creative movement and flowing and like, you know, using your arms and your eye expressions and like bringing that element in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So I'd love to also talk about JDEG because a lot of people in the US have heard about it. They're not really sure. Is it, how does it work? So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's just a um, a semi-precious stone. So the jade, it's nephrite jade. Mm -hmm. And do you recommend always starting with jade or obsidian? Yeah, I... I just come from more of like the traditional practices and just what I've resonated with. And it's usually starting with jade okay? because black obsidian is very strong. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like usually start with the jade. That's more of a balancing neutral and then go into black obsidian like for deeper work, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So it's a, it's a stone that you insert into your vagina or your yoni and you, do you recommend they start with the drilled one so they could put the floss in? Yeah, Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Just until you get the hang of it, because it yeah. can be a bit scary. Like, oh, yeah. has, where's it gone? But it can't get lost, obviously. I still use the, the one with the floss. I'm scared. <laughs> yeah, I know the first time I used it, I was like, I thought it was like, gone. I'm going to go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. What am I going to explain to them? <laughs> There's a crystal in my vagina <laughs> <Yeah>. right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you just insert it and and even just meditating with it to begin can be really powerful. Just doing some Mula Bandha practices and just meditating because even what I've noticed is just having it in with an intention and, you know, setting an intention of what you're working with when you insert the mm-hmm. egg is important. So what you want to release or what you want to clear or heal, you know, and just meditating. When you meditate with it, it's doing little micro Mula Bandhas anyway, mm-hmm. like just really subtle micro Mula Bandhas just by sitting with it. And that is very powerful in itself. And then moving into some basic practices, you know, some breathing practices and some basic yoga practices that are all around like toning the pelvic floor and, you know, like leg lifts and Mm -hmm. cat and cow, spinal flexes that helps really move the energy. So, you know, I teach a lot of that in my online course and Mm -hmm. in my retreats and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's like, it's just a really powerful way to just like bring awareness to your yoni love your yoni and so yoni is the sanskrit word for vagina i don't know mm-hmm. if, who's listening <laughs> yeah like, what's a yoni <laughs> yeah so yeah to just bring awareness to yoni love your yoni and like and also to really yeah tone the pelvic floor and circulate this vital energy this life force energy through our bodies this mm-hmm. is like our you know power source that we can't be just leaking it out and not have any awareness around yeah totally yeah I mean it's in charge of our creativity our abundance our sense of pleasure like all of the things that we want more of stems from this one area and we're so afraid of activating it because we're it's like almost like the black magic that's been done around it, like using the sexuality in in dark ways that we're like afraid of the power that the yoni really has. And when you can like harness that and anchor it in and like use it for like your creative potential, it's, I mean, I talk about like manifesting through orgasm, like all of these things are like powers, like never waste an orgasm. Like there's so much potential in there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, we're creating life with this energy and through that portal of our womb. So yeah, it's exactly that. It's like, so what are you focusing your attention on, you mm-hmm. know, and what are you creating? If we're creating from a muddled womb space, like with filled with our traumas and all these negative belief systems, then we're just going to be creating more of that in our life. So if we work with the menstruation, work with like, yeah, like healing some of these root cause traumas and circulating our own energy, we start to, yeah, become that full vessel for our higher self to create through our womb space, what Mm -hmm. we're here to create and birth in this world, not only children, but like what we're here to birth, Mm -hmm. creative projects and our reality. Absolutely. So what would like a practice, like a morning practice or something look like for healing the womb? Yeah, just bringing your awareness to your womb, like just really keep it simple. Just taking your hands over your womb. Like even if you've, you know, you wake up in the morning, if you do yoga and then go into Shavasana or if you just wake up and you just want to just go into Shavasana or meditation, just placing your hands over your womb and breathing 
in and expanding your womb, really taking deep belly breaths. You know, most of us don't breathe that deep. Like everyone's just breathing very, very lightly. And so our nervous systems are fried basically. So that deep belly breath, like a baby does, you know, it settles the nervous system. And when your nervous system settled, that energy can flow freely through you. And so, yeah, breathing into your womb, breathing into your belly, expanding it and exhaling out your mouth. Like, so really just coming into the body, deep into the body, into the womb. And that in itself is clearing, you know, it's breathing, it's sounding, it's moving. So that's really simple practice that anyone can do. Mm, I love that. And something that we can all just do right now while we're listening to this podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this incredible womanly arts with us. And where can listeners connect with you, join your programs and retreats? Yeah. So you can follow me on Instagram. So I'm tantric.alchemy on Instagram and my website is tantricalchemy.net. Also, I've got a a retreat coming up in Thailand in December Mm -hmm. called Mm -hmm. the Dance of Shakti. So Mm. that's, you know, bringing in the womb practices and also, yeah, the feminine tantric arts and the embodiment of like the, the feminine archetypes through, yeah, tantric goddess deities and yeah, just really deep, creative, like, yeah epic work so yes that sounds amazing well thank you so much for your work and for Mm -hmm. sharing this out there in the world it's so needed and something that women are just awakening to right now and i'm so excited to see like what's going to happen with all of these empowered woo (laughs) man who are like just rocking it yeah and if the world is going to be such a more balanced place for both men and women yeah yeah Yeah. well thank you namaste Wow, that is an episode you may want to go back and listen to to take some notes, especially the seasons and what that's saying about our menstrual cycle. I absolutely love that because sometimes when you're thinking, oh, am I in the follicular phase or ovulation stage or luteal phase or menstruation, it's so scientific. And I think instead looking at, I'm in my summer right now. Oh, I'm in my spring. I'm in my fall. I'm in my winter. That just makes so much more sense on an intuitive level. And I love correlating with the doshas too, which we talked about, but I definitely find that menstruation, when you're really out there, that Durga energy, that is very Pitta. Whereas when you're menstruating and you're inwards, that is very Kapha, but also Lakshmi because it is fertility. The fact that you're menstruating is a sign that you are fertile. So that's what it feels like to me. And then I see the follicular phase, especially being Vata, because it is when you're sparking with new ideas, new interests, you're kind of like the sprouting flower doing things. And then the luteal phase, which is after your ovulation, when you're going into your menstruation, that is sort of like a Saraswati, but more of an internal, deeper one with the shadows. So again, we can all have our own interpretations of it, but that's how I see it. And the fun thing about intuition and connecting with your body is there's no right or wrong answer. And I think we need more of that. We need less of the duality and more of like, what does the period feel like for you? What do you feel like? I mean, I know some women are hornier than ever on their periods. And I know some women who refuse to have sex on their period. So it's so different. It's so bio-individual and that's the beauty of it. So thank you, Nadine of Tantric Alchemy. Be sure to connect with her. If you loved this episode, I would love to send you a free gift, which is the first half of my Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type ebook. This is an unreleased book, different from my book, Eat Feel Fresh. All you gotta do is leave a review on iTunes, take a screenshot before you hit send, and send that screenshot to me at Sahara, S-A-H-A-R-A, at eatfeelfresh.com. And I will send you back the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type. Namaste. Namaste.